Northern Lights by Philip Pullman, Chapter 8, Frustration. <clears throat> Lyra had to adjust to her new sense of her own story, and that couldn't be done in a day. To see Lord Asriel as her father was one thing, but to accept Mrs Coulter as her mother was nowhere near so easy. A couple of months ago she would have rejoiced, of course, and she knew that too, and felt confused. But being Lyra, she didn't fret about it for long, for there, were the Fen there was the Fen town to explore and many Egyptian children to amaze. Before the three days were up, she was an expert with a punt, in her eyes at least, and she'd gathered a gang of urchins about her with tales of her mighty father so unjustly made captive. And then one evening, the Turkish ambassador was a guest at Jordan for dinner, and he was under orders from the Sultan himself to kill my father, right? And he had a ring on his finger with a hollow stone full of poison. And when the wine came round, he made as if to reach across my father's glass, and he sprinkled the poison in. It was done so quick that no one else saw him, but... What sort of poison? demanded a thin-faced girl. Poison out of a special Turkish serpent, Lyra invented. What they catch by playing a pipe to lure out. And then they throw it in then they throw in a sponge soaked in honey, and the serpent bites it and gets his fangs free. And they catch it and milk the venom out of it. Anyway, my father seen what the Turk done, and he says, Gentlemen, I want to propose a toast of friendship between Jordan College and the College of Izmir, which is the college the Turkish ambassador belonged to. And to show our willingness to be friends, he says, we'll swap glasses and drink each other's wine. Oh, and the ambassador was in a fix then because he couldn't refuse to drink without giving him a deadly insult. And he couldn't drink it because he knew it was poisoned. He went pale and he fainted right at the table. And when he come round, they was all sitting there, waiting and looking at him. And then he had to either drink the poison or own up. So what did he do? He drunk it. It took him five whole minutes to die and he was in torment all the time. Did you see it happen? Nah, because girls ain't allowed at the high table. But I seen his body afterwards when they laid him out. His skin was all withered like an old apple and his eyes were starting from his head. In fact, they had to push him back into the sockets and so on. Meanwhile, around the edges of the Fen country, the police were knocking at doors, searching attics and outhouses, inspecting papers and interrogating everyone who claimed to have seen a blonde little girl. And in Oxford, the search was even fiercer. Jordan College was scoured from the dustiest box room to the darkest cellar, and so were Gabriel and St Michael's, till the heads of all the colleges issued a joint protest asserting their ancient rights. The only notion Lyra had of the search for her was the incessant drone of the gas engines of airships crisscrossing the skies. They weren't visible because the clouds were low, and by statute, airships had to keep above a certain height. Fen country. But who knew what cunning spy devices they might carry? Best to keep undercover when she heard them, or wear the oil skin sou'wester over her bright, distinctive hair. And she questioned Mark Hoster about every detail of the story of her birth. She wove the details into a mental tapestry, even clearer and sharper than the story she made up, and lived over and over again the flight from the cottage, the concealment in the closet, the harsh voice challenge, the clashing of swords. Sword? Great God, girl, you're dreaming, Marcosta said. Mr. Coulter had a gun, and Lord Asriel knocked it out of his hand and struck him down with one blow. There were two shots. I wonder you don't remember. You are too, little as you were. The first shot was Edward Coulter, who reached his gun and fired. And the second was Lord Asriel, who tore out his grasp a second time and turned it on him. Shot him right between the eyes and dashed his brains out. And he says, cool as paint, come out, Ma Coster, and bring the baby. Because you were sent up such a howl. You and that demon both. And he took you up and... Dandled you and sat you on his shoulders, walking up and down in high good humour with the dead man at his feet, and called for wine, and bade me swab the floor. 
By the end of the fourth repetition of the story, Lyra was perfectly convinced she did remember it, and even volunteered details of the colour of Mrs. Mr. Coulter's coat and the cloaks and furs hanging in the closet. Mark Costa laughed. And whenever she was alone, Lyra took out the alethiometer and pored over it like a lover with a picture of the beloved. So each image had several meanings, did it? Why shouldn't she work them out? Wasn't she Lord Asriel's daughter? Remembering what Father Coram had said, she tried to focus her mind on three symbols taken at random and clicked the hands round to point at them. She found that if she held the alethiometer just so in her palms and gazed at it in a particularly lazy way, as she thought of it, the long needle would begin to move more purposefully. Instead of its wayward divagations around the dial, it swung smoothly from one picture to another. Sometimes it would pause at three, sometimes two, sometimes five or more. And although she understood nothing of it, she gained a deep, calm enjoyment from it, unlike anything she'd known. Pantalimon would crouch over the dial, sometimes as a cat, sometimes as a mouse, swinging his head round after the needle. And once or twice, the two of them shared a glimpse of meaning that felt as if a shaft of sunlight had struck through the clouds to light up a majestic line of great hills in the distance, something far beyond and never suspected. And Lyra thrilled at those times with the same deep thrill she'd felt all her life on hearing the word North. So the three days passed, with much coming and going between the multitude of boats and the Zal, and then came the evening of the second roping. The hall was more crowded than before, if that was possible. Lyra and the Costas got there in time to sit at the front, and as soon as the flickering lights showed the place was crammed, John Farr and Far Decorum came out on the platform and sat beside, behind the table. John Farr didn't have to make a sign of silence. He just put his great hands flat on the table and looked at the people below, and the hubbub died. Well, he said, you done what I asked, and better than I hoped. I'm a going to call the heads of the six families now to come up here and give over their gold and recount their promises. Nicholas Ropey, you come first. A stout, black-bearded man climbed onto the platform and laid a heavy leather gold, leather bag on the table. That's our gold, he said, and we are for 38 men. Thank you, Nicholas, said John Farr. Father Coram was making a note. The first man stood at the back of the platform as John Farr called for the next and the next, and each came up, laid a bag on the table, and announced the number of men he could muster. The Costas were part of the Stefanski family, and naturally, Tony had been one of the first to volunteer. Lyra noticed his hawk demon shifting from foot to foot and spreading her wings as the Stefanski money and the promise of 23 men were laid before John Farr. When the six family heads had all come up, Farr decorum showed his piece of paper to John Farr, who stood up to address the audience again. Friends, that's a muster of 170 men. I thank you proudly. As for the gold... I make no doubt from the weight of it that you've all dug deep in your coffers and my warm thanks go out for that as well. What we're a going to do is this. We're a going to charter a ship and sail north and find them kids and set them free. From what we know, there might be some fighting to do. It won't be the first time nor it won't be the last. But we never had to fight yet with people who kidnap children and we shall have to be uncommon cun cunning. But, we're, but we ain't going to come back without our kids. Yes, Dirk Viris. A man stood up and said, Lord Farr, do you know why they capture them kids? We heard it's a theological matter. They're making an experiment. But what nature it is, we don't know. To tell you the truth, we don't even know whether any harms are coming to them. 
But whatever it is, good or bad, they got no right to reach out by night and pluck little children out of the heart of their families. Yes, Raymond Van Garrett. The man who'd spoken at the first meeting stood up and said, That child, Lord Farr, the one you spoke of as being sort, the one is sitting in the front row now. I heard as all the folk living around the edge of the fence is having their houses turned upside down on her account. I heard there's a move in Parliament this very day to rescind our ancient privileges on account of this child. Yes, friends, he said over the babble of shocked whispers. They're a-going to pass a law, doing away with our right to free movement in and out the fence. Now, Lord Farr, what we want to know is this. Who is this child on account of which we might come to such a pass? She ain't Egyptian child, not as I heard. How comes it that a landloper child can put us all in danger? Lyra looked up at John Farr's massive frame. Her heart was thumping so much she could hardly hear the first words of his reply. Now spell it out, Raymond. Don't be shy, he said. You want us to give this child up to them she's a-fleeing from. Is that right? The man stood obstinately frowning, but said nothing. Well, perhaps you would, perhaps you wouldn't, John Farr continued. But if any man or woman needs a reason for doing good, ponder on this. That little girl is a daughter of Lord Asriel, no less. For them has forgotten, it were Lord Asriel who interceded with the Turk for the life of Sam Brokerman. It were Lord Asriel who allowed Egyptian boats free passage on the canal through his property. It were Lord Asriel who defeated the watercourse bill in Parliament to our great and lasting benefit. And it were Lord Asriel who fought day and night in the floods of 53 and plunged headlong in the water twice to pull out young Rood and Nellie Koopman. You've forgotten that? Shame. Shame on you. Shame. And now that same Lord Asriel is held in the farthest, coldest, darkest regions of the wild captive in the fortress of Svalbard. Do I need to tell you the kind of creatures are guarding him there? And this is his little daughter in our care. And Raymond Van Garrett would hand her over to the authorities for a bit of peace and quiet. Is that right, Raymond? Stand up and answer, man. But Raymond Van Garrett had sunk to his seat and nothing would make him sound. A low hiss of disapproval sounded through the great hall and Lyra felt the shame he must be feeling as well as a deep glow of pride in her brave father. John Farr turned away and looked at the other men at the platform. Nicholas Ropeby, I'm a putting you in charge of finding a vessel and commanding her once we sail. Adam Stefanski, I want you to take charge of the arms and munitions and command the fighting. Roger Van Poppel, you look to all the other stores from food to cold weather clothing. Simon Hartman, you'll be treasurer and account to us all for a proper apportion, apportionment of our gold. Benjamin de Reuter, I want you to take charge of spying. There's a great deal we ought to find out and I'm a giving you the charge of that and you'll report to Father Coram. Michael Costanza, you're going to be responsible for coordinating the first four leaders' work and you'll report to me. And if I die, you're my second in command and you'll take over. Now, I made my dispositions according to custom. If any man or woman seeks to disagree, they may do so freely. After a moment, a woman stood up. Lord Farr, ain't you a taking any women on this expedition? Look after them kids once you found them. No, Nell, we shall have little space as it is. Any kids we free will be better off in our care than where they've been. But supposing you find out that you can't rescue him without some women in disguise as guards or nurses or whatever. Well, I hadn't thought of that, John Farr admitted. Well, consider that most carefully when we retire into the parley room. You have my promise. She sat down and a man stood up. Lord Farr, I heard you say that Lord Asriel is in captivity. Is it part of your plan to rescue him? Because if it is... 
And if he's in the power of them bears, I think you said, that's going to need more than 170 men. And good friend as Lord Azrael is to us, I don't know as there's any call on us to go as far as that. Adrian Brax, you're not wrong. What I had it in my mind to do was keep our eyes and ears open and see what knowledge we can glean while we're in the north. It may be that we can do something to help him, and it may not. But you can trust me not to use what you've provided, man and gold, for any purpose outside the stated one of finding our children and bringing them home. Another woman stood up. Lord Far, we don't know what them gobblers might have been doing our children. We're all rumours and stories, fearful things. We hear about children with no heads, or about children cut in half and sewn together, or, or about things too awful to mention. I, I'm truly sorry to distress anyone, but we all heard this kind of thing, and I want to get it out in the open. Now, in case you find anything of that awful kind, Lord Far, I hope you're a going to take powerful revenge. I hope you ain't going to let thoughts of mercy and gentleness hold your hand back from striking and striking hard and, and delivering a mighty blow to the heart of that infernal wickedness. And I'm sure I speak for any mother who's lost a child of the gobblers. There was a loud murmur of agreement as she sat down. Heads were nodding all over the zaal. John Farr waited for silence and said, Nothing will hold my hand, Margaret, save only judgment. If I stay my hand in the north, it will only be to strike the harder in the south. To strike a day too soon is as bad as striking a hundred miles off. To be sure, there's a warm passion behind what you say. But if you give in to that passion, friends, you're doing what I always warned you again. You're replacing the satisfaction of your own feelings above the work you have to do. Our work here is first rescue, then punishment. It ain't gratification for upset feelings. Our feelings don't matter. If we rescue the kids, but we can't punish the gobblers, we've done the main task. But if we aim to punish the gobblers first, and by doing so, lose the chance of rescuing the kids, we've failed. But be assured of this, Margaret, when the time comes to punish, we shall strike such a blow as will make their hearts faint and fearful. We shall strike the strength out of them. We shall leave them ruined and waste, broken and shattered, torn in a thousand pieces and scattered of the fall winds. My own hammer is thirsty for blood, friends. She ain't tasted blood since I slew the Tartar champion on the steps of Kazakhstan. She's been a hanging in my boat and dreaming, but she can smell blood in the wind from the north. She spoke to me last night and told me of her thirst, and I said, soon, gal, soon. Margaret, you can worry about a hundred things, but don't you worry that John Farr's heart is too soft to strike a blow when the time comes. And the time will come under judgment, not under passion. Is there anyone else who wants to speak? Speak if you will. But no one did. And presently, John Farr reached for the closing bell and rang it hard and loud, swinging it high and shaking the peals out of it so that they filled the hall and rang the rafters. John Farr and the other men left the platform for the parley room. Lyra was a little disappointed. Didn't they want her there too? But Tony laughed. Oh, they got plans to make. He said, you've done your part, Lyra. Now it's for John Farr and the council. But I ain't done nothing yet, Lyra protested as she followed the others reluctantly out of the hall and down the cobbled road toward the jetty. All I'd done was run away from Mrs. Coulter. That's just the beginning. I want to go north. Tell you what, said Tony. I'll bring you back a walrus tooth. That's what I'll do. Lyra scowled. For his part, Pantaliman occupied himself by making monkey faces at Tony's demon, who closed her tawny eyes in disdain. 
Lyra drifted to the jetty and hung about with her new companions, dangling lanterns on strings over the black water to attract the goggle-eyed fish who swam slowly up to be lunged at with sharp sticks and mist. But her mind was on John Farr and the parley room, and long before she slipped away up the cobbles again to the Tsar. There was a light in the parley room window. It was too high to look through, but she could hear a low rumble of voices inside. So she walked up to the door and knocked on it firmly five times. The voices stopped. A chair scraped across the floor and the door opened, spilling warm naphtha lamp light out on the damp step. Yes, said the man who'd opened it. Beyond him, Lyra could see the other men around the table with bags of gold stacked neatly and papers and pens and glasses and a crock of Geneva. I want to come north, Lyra said, so they could all hear it. I want to come and help rescue the kids. That's what I set out to do when I run away from Mrs Coulter. And before that, even I meant to rescue my friend Roger, the kitchen boy from Jordan who was took. I want to come and help. I can do navigation and I can take ambaromagnetic readings of the aurora. And I know what parts of a bear you can eat and all kinds of useful things. You'll be sorry if you got up there and found you needed me and found you'd left me behind. And like that woman said, you might need women to play a part. Well, you might need kids too. You don't know. So you ought to take me, Lord Far. Excuse me for interrupting your talk. She was inside the room now, and all the men and their demons were watching her. Some with amusement and some with irritation. But she had eyes only for John Farr. Pantaliman sat up in her arms, his wildcat eyes blazing green. John Farr said... Lyra, there ain't no question of taking you into danger, so don't delude yourself, child. Stay here and help my caster and keep safe. That's what you got to do. But I'm learning how to read the alethiometer too. It's coming clearer every day. You're bound to need that. Bound to. He shook his head. No, he said. I know your heart was set and going north, but it's my belief not even Mrs. Coulter was going to take you. If you want to see the North, you'll have to wait till all this trouble's over. Now off with you. Pantaliman hissed quietly, but John Farr's demon took off from the back of his chair and flew at them with black wings, not threateningly, but like a reminder of good manners. And Lyra turned on her heel as the crow glided over her head and wheeled back to John Farr. The door shut behind her with a decisive click. We will go, she said to Pantaliman. Let him try and stop us. We will.